Thank you. I'm a musicologist, and my research is focused on musical interactions between Asia and the US, especially on how groups of people have used music to represent other groups over the past 150 years. I offer a course that's closely related to this research, a tutorial entitled American Pop Orientalism. And in that course, we investigate Orientalist representation in Broadway musicals, Hollywood films, popular songs, television, from the late 19th century to today. We start the semester by trying to figure out what Orientalism is and what music might have to do with it. Orientalist representation involves depicting groups of people, places, or musical traditions as exotic from the perspective of the composer or the intended audience. The larger idea is that these depictions can shape opinions and actions against the exotic. Now, the exotic, of course, exists only in the mind or in the ear of the beholder. My students focus not only on how Asians and Asian Americans have been represented, but also on representations of Asian music itself. We found that Asian musical traditions are consistently represented as outmoded and utterly alien, and that the image of Asians and Asian Americans participating in popular culture is apparently always good for a laugh. Finally, that stereotypical representations of Asian music are accepted as actual Asian music by many listeners. As I've listened to my students debate Orientalism, and as I've struggled to finish a book on the subject, I've often wondered, where and when does Orientalism end? I'll give you the punchline now. It doesn't. I've been charting Orientalism for over 20 years, and I've yet to find any boundaries. I'll offer a few examples illustrating my idea that Orientalist representation is fully present in contemporary pop culture and that it repeatedly turns up where you might least expect it. Let's start back in the late 19th century. In the 1870s, the US experienced a large influx of Asian immigrants. Welcomed at first as cheap labor, these immigrants soon inspired racist animosity. The influx of Asian immigrants and the resulting tensions spurred an outpouring of popular song. For example, I've collected some 375 pieces on Japanese subjects that were published between 1890 and 1930. You can see the distribution of songs across this period in this chart. The spike around 1904 is a response to the Russo-Japanese War and to Puccini's Madama Butterfly and later spikes correspond to spin-offs of a particular smash hit. A decline follows the 1924 Asian Exclusion Act, and I found very few pieces published at all in the 1930s. Musicologists Judy Tsao and Rob Lansfield have collected hundreds of songs on Chinese subjects from the same period. The lyrics, cover art, and music of these songs are shaped by the principle that the more stereotypes you can pack into a song, the better. Very common to use silly rhymes and nonsense text and to spin endlessly on the ch in Chinese or in the derogatory racist term that stuck the most, chink. In some cases, composers and lyricists responded to specific events in Asian American history. For example, about five miles east of here in North Adams in 1870, 75 Chinese men were brought in as strike breakers at a shoe factory. This episode um, was widely reported in the press back then and has more recently served as the basis for a novel by my colleague Karen Shepard, The Celestials. No relation, by the way. These North Adams Chinese strike breakers inspired at least two specific songs. The hugely popular blackface minstrel Billy West performed both of these, and the lyrics of these songs were published in his 1873 songster. In The Chinese Shoemaker, romance between a white female and a Chinese male proves disastrous. Several prominent slurs are here. The exotic shoemaker delights in eating dogs and mice, and there are indirect references to the Chinese male Q hairstyle, most often referred to as a pigtail in these songs. Most significant for our purposes 
is that this Chinese shoemaker is killed for his music. Next day, he brought her home a gong and swore he'd sing her a Chinese song. He scared all the neighbors everywhere, so they killed him and sold him for his hair. I'm particularly interested in the number of popular songs that make fun of Asian and Asian American attempts to engage in popular music. In the Paul Whiteman collection held here at Williams College, I found a recording of the 1920 hit song, Chingaling's Jazz Bazaar. On the sheet music cover, we see a Chinese couple dancing a foxtrot, while the traditional Chinese musicians have pushed, been pushed to the very front edge of the frame. That guy in the lower right looks particularly displeased by this musical displacement. Central to this example is the assumption that Chinese participation in jazz would be comic. The narrator promises, quote, that we will hear a China tune played on a jazz guitar, which from the song's Orientalist viewpoint would clearly be a riot. The lyrics are typical, starting with the made-up name Chingaling. The phrase, way down in Chinatown, points to the ultimate exotic locale within the US, and the melodic line descends ominously. Way down in Chinatown. The slur, the use of the slur, chink, and the line, when they roll their almond eyes, it's pigtail paradise, reveal that it's really all packed in here. The narrator tells us that the dancers at this jazz bazaar appear with swell kimonas on. Throughout the history of Orientalist representation, Japanese and Chinese images have been used interchangeably. Finally, the erotic ecstasy of this exotic dive is conveyed in the nonverbal fake Chinese exclamation, hop toy chunga lunga fungoi. The music was composed by a noted female songwriter and was advertised as a Chinese foxtrot. For the phrase, soon you'll hear a Chinese drum, she used a particular rhythm and melodic gesture to represent that exotic music and used the same lick for the phrase, hear the pitter-patter of the sandaled feet, in reference to their dancing. The gesture is heard five times in the chorus section alone. Down to ching a ling a ling ling China Jazz Bazaar. You're bound to hear a China tune played on a jazz guitar. You'll see each China John with swell kimonos on and sing song curly. Oh boy, hop toy, chunga lung a bung oi, here's a pit of patter of the sandal feet. And every jazzy little dance thing to his hand of me. Don't we know Orientalism when we hear it? That 4 sixteenths and 2 eighths gesture with staccato articulation and repeated pitch, da 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 da, that is by far the most common musical stereotype for East Asia. Now, I've heard lots of Japanese and Chinese traditional music, and I teach a course on Asian music, and I've never noticed a preponderance of that rhythm. This musical sign is used in the same derogatory spirit and with the same impact as the verbal and visual markers I mentioned before. Orientalism is not specific to the Tin Pan Alley musical era. The 1980s, to me, the very recent past, uh, saw an upswing in Orientalism in pop culture. For example, in 1983, we heard Styx's Mr. Roboto and David Bowie's China Girl incessantly on the radio. Here's the very opening of China Girl. Clearly, this is Orientalist musical representation in its most blunt form, as the music theorist Eli Hisama has argued. The sonic stereotype is front and center, followed by the common object and adjective, little China girl. However, much in the rest of the song signals parody, 
and makes us rethink that opening. Is it possible to undermine Orientalism by overdoing it? The jury is still out. Somehow, however, I doubt that as a teenage boy in 1983, I caught any parody rather than having Orientalist stereotypes reinforced. OK, enough with the ancient past. What about today? On November 24th, Billions of viewers of the American Music Awards and many more cents on YouTube saw Katy Perry perform her powerful hit, Unconditionally, in an over-the-top Orientalist production. This offers a perfect case study of the power of Orientalism. The lyrics of the song are a simple romantic situation. The rather operatic and stunning official music video employs religious imagery suggesting an unconditional love for God. But at the AMA performance, dressed in an odd mashup of a kimono and Chinese fashion, Perry put the most common Orientalist stereotype on display, the submissive, self-sacrificing Asian woman, a sister of Madame Butterfly and Miss Saigon. Musically, they added a shamisen and shakuhachi sound, in addition to taiko drums and, and dancers carrying long-necked lutes. The countless comments on the web about this performance provide data to answer the question, how does the American public perceive Orientalist representation today? The apparent majority response was to defend Perry and claim she was paying homage to Japan. Actually, I think she was paying homage to Orientalist representations of Japan, going back, consciously or not, uh, going back through Madonna to 1950s Hollywood films to silent film era Madame Butterflies and to those sheet music covers I alluded to earlier. When is the use of Orientalist techniques and stereotypes somehow no longer Orientalist? It seems suspicious, uh, suspiciously self-serving to me to claim that even though the AMA production of Unconditionally employed all the old Orientalist images, we are somehow different from the past, and so it really isn't Orientalism at all. You can bet we'll discuss this example at our final seminar meeting the next time I offer the tutorial, and I know how to finish my book now. <laughs> Thank you, Katy Perry. I frequently bring my research into my teaching, and my teaching shapes my research. It is highly unusual, however, for one of my students to become the subject of my research, but I recently published an article on the most famous Williams alum of all time. Yes, more famous than President Garfield or Stephen Sondheim, the intensely musical and ultra-cool Wong Lee Holm. After class one day back in 1997, a senior announced that he was going to miss an entire week for an interview. What? You're going to miss my class for a job interview? No, professor. Uh, I have an interview with Elton John. We are both Sony artists. That's how I discovered that the leading pop star in Taiwan was my student. Lee Holm was born in Rochester, New York, and learned much of his Mandarin here from my colleague Neil Kubler. Soon after graduating from Williams, his career skyrocketed, and he became one of the biggest stars in China and throughout East Asia, appearing on McDonald's placemats in Beijing, starring in a film directed by Ang Lee, and appearing and performing at the Beijing Olympics closing ceremony. He's even been named one of the 100 most influential Asian Americans of all time. As an Asian American, he has enjoyed a certain exotic cachet that enhanced his appeal in East Asia. He frequently inserts bits of English in his lyrics playing into this. Starting around 2000, Lee Holm became increasingly interested in Chinese traditional music. And he developed what he has termed a chinked out style of pop. In using the traditional slur, chink, Li Holm intended to take its negative connotations and turn them upside down. His use of traditional Chinese music was intended as a statement of cultural pride. However, Chinese opera and the other traditions that he has sampled are rather exotic to most Chinese-speaking teenagers. Can Orientalist representation be found within Asia? Or is it by definition created only in the West? The lyrics of Li Holmes' Beside the Plum Tree reference a specific Chinese opera, and he sings, 
How I wish to be in that story where the pace is slower and the atmosphere mysterious. The song features instruments of the operatic genre as well as the Chinese performer's voice. In the music video, Lee Holm nods his head in approval as the opera singer seems to dance to Lee Holm's music. However, the opera singer's voice is then manipulated electronically to sound as though through old lo-fi speakers. The opera singer then appears within the frame of a vintage television set, suggesting that Chinese Kun Shu opera is irretrievably of the past. It reminds me of that cover of Chingling's Jazz Bazaar, with the traditional instrumentalist pushed to the edge of the frame. <laughs> The music video for Mistake in the Flower Field also explores the relationship between modern life and traditional opera. Lee Home, coming from the modern world, appears to travel through the video screen of his cell phone to witness the operatic performance, entering the world of the beautiful and exotic female opera actress. Other examples from Lee Holm's albums point even more clearly to the tradition of European Orientalist opera. In the music video for Shangri-La, Lee Holm assumes the archetypal position of the Western male character encountering his exotic ideal flower girl. We see him hiking in a remote landscape, suffering a fall, and then coming to in a mystical realm with an exotic beauty who gazes at him longingly before he is forced to say farewell. With these examples, we've encountered aspects of Orientalist musical representation from 1870 to 2013, and from Tin Pan Alley to Taiwan. Though we might not notice it, and may feel we have overcome it, Orientalist musical representation is very much part of our daily lives. I seem to hear it wherever I go. Thank you very much.